Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Community Church. It is a joy to be here with you in worship. As we enter into worship, please stand and join us in the responsive call. We give thanks to you, O Lord, our God. With one heart and one voice, we proclaim your wondrous deeds to all the earth. We will be glad and rejoice in God. We have come to sing the praises of the Lord Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He is the stronghold of the oppressed and the firmament of the righteous. We know and trust the name of the Lord. In his name and in his name alone, we put our hope and trust. Come, people of God, let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before our God, the maker of the heavens and the earth. We bow our hearts before you, O God, God, in worship and in praise. May your name be known, be our tongues. 
May your praise always be on our lips so that the whole world will know that God, the Lord, is always good and faithful. Amen and amen. Good morning. Let's sing together praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Join me in glad because he is able, right? He's able to do more than we could ever imagine or think. He is able of everything.
Our scripture reading is from Psalm 119, 33 through 40. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my life.
Father, there is so much in this world to take our eyes off of you. Father, Satan, our enemy, roars like a lion. He comes and he wants to devour us. He wants to use every material thing in this world. He wants to use every person and every relationship to take our eyes off of you. But Father, we know there is none like you. There's no thing, no person, and no relationship that is like you. So Father, we ask, would you roar like the Lion of Judah? Would you be stronger than Satan's powers? Would you turn our eyes back to you every single day? Would you be our only glory, our only prize, the only thing that we set our hearts on every single day, Father? Would we seek you first, that you would add to us every righteousness, every reward, every joy? Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. And welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered together with you again this morning for worship. If you are here for Sunday school this morning, make your way to the back of the sanctuary. If you're, uh, if you're new this morning and you are, you know, this tall and would like to make your way to Sunday school, our teachers are back there and they would be glad to uh, meet together with you. We have folks who can show you the way. It's great to have you all with us. I want to share just a few uh, things about uh, what's happening in the life of the church with you all. And I suppose we should probably start with the barbecue dinner and uh, family fun fest that we held last night, right? Um, what an incredible evening we had, Yes. It was just a wonderful time of sharing together. And uh, let me share, well, okay, you're seeing all the pictures, but let me share uh, um, just some really great things about that. First of all, let me say thank you again to all of the people who helped in any way, whether that was in advance of the event, whether that was uh, making phone calls for volunteers and all other kinds of things, whether that was uh, grocery shopping and, 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 and all of those kind of things. Maybe it was helping to prep food. Uh, maybe it was selling tickets. Maybe it was serving the food. Maybe it was cleaning up in the beacon room. Maybe it was all other kinds of things. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the volunteers that it took to make this happen. I tried to um, go through the list of people uh, and count up the number of uh, different people it took to make the last night happen. Um, I know that I didn't count everybody, and I got to 40. That's how many people it takes. So uh, look around the room. Um, it's not much more than 40. <laughs> so I'm just saying thank you to you all for making last night possible. Um, also, I want to share with you, I mentioned last night at the end of the event that uh, something happened yesterday that has not happened with this event. Before we even went into the night, um, because of the number of donations that had been made, um, so this year, different from other years, we had had donations of meat for the event, donations of all of the other ingredients that we needed to make the different um, foods, um, donations of all the prizes that our kids won at the games. Because of all those donations, as we went into the event with the pre-sale of tickets, we had already paid back the expenses and were already making a profit before we opened the doors last night which was incredible, okay? So after we um, added everything up just last night and uh, we subtracted the expenses that we had, we are um, 
overjoyed to announce that we have set a record. We have broken a record. We've never made this much money um, on the barbecue dinner. Um, we have raised $3,084 so far. Yes. Which is uh, incredible. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. Um, and now the job isn't quite over. Um, we have three refrigerators full of food. Um, so, and last night people were like, man, what are we going to do with this? Well, so reality is the first couple of years we did this dinner, there were people who couldn't make it or whatever else, or people who said, man, I wish I had more. And so we purposely make extra so that folks can buy extra and take it home and freeze it, whatever else. So we need you to do that today. After church, uh, at the corner by my office, there are two tables. There will be pork, chicken, beans, all the things we had last night. They're all packaged up, ready to go for you, including extra sauce, okay? Um, please stop by. Please take things home. There is a free will donation container out there. Um, I did put the poster up for the sauce. Um, please just free will donation that as well, but I put that up there just so you can get a grasp of, like, what it costs to make it. Um, but... It, please take these things home. We want you to have them and enjoy them. But if you can pitch something into the free will donation, that certainly goes a long way towards helping uh, the operating fund of this church as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I can't say that enough. It was a fantastic event. And um, uh, every year I say, well, maybe we shouldn't do this. It's so much work. But guess what? We're going to do it again. So... Um, <laughs> It was great. Thank you so much, everybody. What a tremendous event. Um, we have another great event coming up this coming Saturday morning, uh, beginning at 8.30 a.m. is our Saturday morning study and breakfast. Uh, we will have a homemade breakfast for you beginning at 8.30, and then approximately 9 or 9.15, we will start study. Um, uh, I'll lead study, and uh, it, it's, uh, we, we wrap up by about 10.30. It's just a great opportunity to have some fellowship and a great breakfast to start your Saturday. Uh, I'm looking at the weather. It, it appears it's going to be a, a pretty nice day for November, which means if you haven't yet done your fall cleanup at your house, this is a good day to come get a, a nice hot breakfast, get the word, and then go home and get those things done because you know the cold weather's coming. So um, please join us this Saturday morning for breakfast and study. Also uh, coming up very quickly is our Christmas decorating. Um, that Christmas decorating party is going to happen on Sunday, November 26th, uh, beginning at, I believe it's... Two o'clock. Yes, two o'clock. Um, we will decorate the church for the Christmas season. Um, and then once we have the decorating done, we will have a nacho bar for dinner. Uh, we will have a Christmas classic, uh, you know, the television specials that everybody loves to watch. We'll have those on the big screen um, while we have some fellowship and enjoy the nacho bar. Please join us. There is a sign-up sheet for the Christmas decorating at the um, information center. Um, certainly, if it turns out that you have to be, be available and you want to come, that's fine. There'll be plenty of food. But we're just trying to get a grasp of how many people might be thinking of coming um, so we know how much food to prepare for that nacho bar. Um, also, we have our women's Advent service that we have to start telling you about. Um, that is coming up on December 5th. Again, I can't believe we're already talking about December, but it's right around the corner. December 5th, Tuesday evening, December 5th. This is an annual event um, that is put on by the women of our worship team. And it is a beautiful start to the Christmas season every year. Um, and I don't know, this has been going on for 20 years or more probably. Um, but it is a great start to the season. Um, and it is a, a women's service. It is communion. Um, there will be a message by... A, ref a reflection by our, our pastor's wife. Um, and then afterwards, uh, some of the men of the congregation will be serving a uh, reception with um, some light hors d'oeuvres and, um, and desserts. It begins at 7 p.m. Um, yes, I know for some of you, you're like 7 p.m. Yeah, but we have to remember, a lot of our folks still work. And so we're trying to make it so that they can still attend. Um, it starts at 7 p.m., 
Uh, and it is just a beautiful, beautiful night to remember that amidst all of the busyness and the chaos of the Christmas season, um, we have a reason to celebrate, and his name is Jesus, and to get the focus back on him. So please plan to invite uh, your, uh, your, your friends, ladies, and come and join together with the ladies of the church. Uh, and men of the congregation, you'll be getting an email, me, email, email from me soon um, so that you can help me with the reception that evening. Um, last thing that I want to tell you is that... Um, the week of Thanksgiving, the office hours for the church are changing slightly. Instead of, being, instead of the office hours being Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 9 to noon, it's going to be Monday and Tuesday from 9 to noon. And then the office will be closed Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We will reopen the following Tuesday, okay? Just so that everybody is aware of that. And Jen has another. I forgot the family Christmas dinner. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> because we haven't had enough food. Family Christmas dinner, yes. This is also a very fun event that we want you to get on your calendar. It's going to take place on um, Saturday evening, December 3rd. Uh, it will begin at 4 p.m. Um, it is our annual tradition of coming together as a family for Christmas dinner. Um, it will begin at 4 p.m. with our mocktail hour. Notice I didn't say the other word. I said mocktail hour. Um, and, uh, and I will be, be behind the not bar making mocktails for you all. Uh, and, uh, and we will have uh, live music, right? Jill will be uh, giving us live music during the mocktail hour. Then we will have dinner served at 5 p.m. in the Beacon Room. And, uh, and during that dinner, we will have some Christmas trivia. We'll play a couple of Christmas games, and Roz will lead us in our carol sing. So it will be a very fun evening. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet for the Christmas dinner at the Information Center as well. That is a free will donation event. Um, it usually is very highly attended, very popular. Uh, so please do start. Oh, yes, and Santa will be here as well. We are so thankful to have a resident Santa who always tells us, this is my last year, and we say, yeah, right. But Santa will be here as well, so we're very thankful for that. Um, so please plan to join us for the family Christmas dinner as well. Lots of great things coming up. Um, it is such a fun time to be together as the family of God. We hope that you'll join us for all of these things. Now, anything else that I missed? Okay. How about the prayer list? In your bulletin, we have our prayer list this week. Please join us in praying for all of those folks. Um, and you'll notice there have been some additions to that list this week. Um, I know some folks were asking last week uh, if they uh, had a prayer request. Just a reminder, you can drop those in the tithing box right outside the door. You can call the church office during church hours, or you can certainly email us um, with those uh, prayer requests as well. Um, but would you please join me in a general word of prayer this morning? Father God, we do thank and praise you this morning for the awesome privilege and opportunity we have to come and gather with you. Lord, we have so many reasons to give you thanks this morning. We begin with the most simple of those reasons. You have woken us up. You have given us breath this morning. You have given us the sunshine to illumine our day. The very simplest of gifts, Father, and sometimes we overlook these. Father, you have given us our families. You have given us this family, Cornerstone Faith Community Church. Father, you have given us reason to celebrate today. What a joyous time of fellowship we had last evening. And Father, while we do rejoice that you have made it possible for us to bring in much needed funds for the ministry of this church, for the mission of the gospel in this place, we recognize that that is but a small piece of what took place here last night. The real truth is that our community came and experienced Jesus in so many different ways. 
And so, Father, we give you thanks for the many hands that made that possible, the many hands who were the hands and the feet of Jesus last night. And Father, we pray for many more opportunities just like this to serve our community, to serve one another, to be Jesus to one another. And Father, we don't know what small mustard seeds were planted last night. And Father, we have no idea if we will ever even see the fruit of them. But you do. And so, Father, we pray for caretakers of those seeds. Perhaps we are the caretakers or perhaps others will be. But Father, will you tend to those seeds that were planted last night? Lord, we come to you humbly as your people and we bow before you. We bring our prayer list. We bring the names that we have listed before you, both publicly amongst one another and in our hearts. Your word tells us that before we even speak these names to you, you know their needs. You have heard the prayers of your people. And so, Father, we ask that you would be working for each and every one of them. We ask that you would heal the sick, that you would provide for those who have need, that you would comfort those who are grieving that you would bind up the brokenhearted. Father, there are so many in our world who are struggling right now. We continue to think of our brothers and sisters in Israel. We ask that you would bring peace to the warfare there. Father, we are so thankful for the number of ways that you continue to provide for us. The difficulty of your word for us today is that so often our eyes are shifted onto other things. The reality is we let the desires of our hearts get out of control. And Father, we become greedy. So Lord, before we even hear one sentence from your word, we ask now that you would prepare our hearts for this word. That you would prepare our hearts to have this word fall fresh on us, that that we would be ready to recognize greed in our own lives. And Father, that you would prepare us to think more in terms of need rather than greed. Father, help us to recognize that we are not defined, our worth is not defined by the things that we own, but rather we are defined in you. Our worth is in your name and you alone. Father, we ask this in your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to hear God's word this morning, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? That as we hear this word, it would fall fresh on our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. We conclude our look at the topic, it is not easy being a Christian this morning, with the words from Jesus, Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word for this day. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundance, abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, I wonder, has there ever been something in your life that you just had to have? Has there ever been something in your life that you just had to have? Now, I, I want to be clear. I'm not speaking here of things that we actually need. For, for example, you know, you have to have toilet paper, right? I, I don't mean that. What I'm asking this morning is I want you to maybe even think back to your childhood. Probably I want you to think especially back to like those preteen years or maybe even those early teenage days. Was there something that you just had to have? Perhaps either because everyone else was talking about getting one of those things or because everybody else already had one of those things. It is no secret that one of my absolute favorite movies of all time and certainly probably one of my favorite Christmas movies of all time is A Christmas Story. <laughs> Side note, just so you know, I have loved this movie since before it became a cult classic and you could go into any store and buy all kinds of things related to this movie. In this movie, Ralphie, a fifth grade boy, spends the entirety of the movie scheming to convince his mother and father that he desperately needs a Red Ryder BB gun. So hilarity ensues as we see Ralphie going throughout his days leading up to that Christmas in 1952, where, as the old Christmas story says, what to his wondering eyes should appear but a Red Ryder BB gun under the Christmas tree. Of course, the final plot twist of the movie was that, well, as all along Ralphie's mother had been saying, you'll shoot your eye out. Well, as Ralphie took that gun out into the backyard, that's just what happened. He darn near shot his eye out. He broke his glasses, first shot in the backyard, 
dreams crushed. But he just had to have that Red Rider BB gun. There's this online blogger, Anna Lee West, whose blog is titled, Life is Funny. She wrote recently of a time when she was growing up that she just had to have a pair of speed roller skates. This is what she said. She said, when it comes to good things happening for others, I'm not the jealous type. I believe there is enough happiness and success to go around, and so I enjoy rooting for other people. But as a child, I do remember coveting one thing, speed skates. Growing up in a small town, it was not uncommon to spend one or two nights every weekend at the skating rink. I was a pretty fast skater, and I rarely hesitated to step up to the line whenever they paused whatever Rick James song they were playing and they announced the racing heats. But try as I might, I never won my heat if it included kids from the speed skating team. I never considered even for a second that they were just simply faster. I knew in the deepest part of my gut that they won races because of one thing, those bad-to-the-bone speed skates. Heaven on wheels, the low-profile ankle, the wide wheels, the low-flat stopper, I'd swoon. I loved those type of skates with a fervor unmatched with anything under the sun. They not only looked incredible, but they were more stable than the high-sitting tan-colored abominations I rented from the desk. The jokes with the wheel bearings that hadn't been lubricated for 91 years. The ones with the jacked up stoppers that were different heights from the right to the left. Something a true speed skater would never expect. Didn't my parents know that I needed proper gear in order to be a true speed skater? Well, I guess not because it wasn't happening. They were expensive and much to my surprise, we were not rolling in the dough. I had no idea that my brother and sister, we all thought we were rich. My parents provided for us in a way that confused us about our wealth. Had my intense longing gone unnoticed? Had my older siblings' oscillating interests schooled them to the temporary longings of my heart? I saw no conceivable way that they could have the foresight to know that my living would not be made by speed skating. I felt I was being held back in my attempts to be more than a Saturday night limbo champ. Sure, I could limbo lower than anyone else at the skating rink. I'd hear people coo and squeal when I could shrink to the size of a baby panda on my way under that bar. But my expert limbo skills were simply a product of my size. I wanted to run my bony little fingers along the rink as I went into the turn. I wanted to cross the finish line first. Even though I knew my full potential could not be realized in rented skates, I had to let my dream die. I entered fewer races because I simply could not abide being second or third place. Occasionally, I still raced just because I needed to feel the breeze to cool me off before the DJ announced couple skate. My young boyfriend, Brandon, would roll up to me with his hand out, and we would take a few laps. He would have his eyes on me. I would have one eye on his baby blue eyes and one eye on his super rad speed skates. Commandment number 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's house nor his wife, nor his male or female servant, nor his oxen or donkey, nor anything that belongs to him. You shall not covet. It's a word we don't use that much today. What does covet actually mean? To covet means to yearn to possess. To yearn to possess, or, or maybe it is better said, an intense and all-consuming desire for something that someone else possesses. 
an intense and all-consuming desire for something that someone else possesses. To covet something is so much more than just a simple want for something. The idea of coveting differs from wanting in that the desire of coveting is all-consuming. Now, here's how most theologians tend to see the difference. Let's say, for instance, that you happen to be at the grocery store. Now, let's say that You happen to be walking up to the checkout stand and you happen to notice a lonely Kit Kat bar off to the side of the checkout stand. And you happen just to think, you know, I'm I'm hungry. And, you know, I kind of want a Kit Kat bar. You want a Kit Kat bar, right? So you're faced with two choices. You either buy the Kit Kat bar or you don't buy the Kit Kat bar. But it is highly unlikely that the decision whether or not to buy the Kit Kat bar is going to be all-consuming. I highly doubt that if you decide not to buy the Kit Kat bar, you're going to go out to your car and sit there and fret, going, oh, I didn't buy that Kit Kat bar. Oh, life is over. Right? However, for people, for many people, there are things And maybe even worse, there are people, there are relationships, there are talents, there are livelihoods that they do not have, but they wish they had. They wish that they possessed. And their desire, their wish to possess these things or these people, or these relationships, or these talents, or these livelihoods, is more than a simple want. It becomes for them an all-consuming concern. When they wake up in the morning, the first thought in their mind is how they wished they had that thing. How might they scheme to get it? And when they go to bed at night, their last thought is, how I want that thing. And how might I get it? Tony Evans suggests that a covetous person is never, ever satisfied. He fails to trust God to provide for him, and he assumes that God is holding out on him. The antidote for covetousness is contentment. Dr. Warren Wearsby responds and says, covetous people will break all of God's commandments in order to satisfy their desires. Because at the heart of sin is the sin in the heart. Sometimes theologians have suggested that there's a kind of connection between addiction and covetousness. Where the addiction is singularly focused on finding the next hit. Whatever the substance of the addiction might be. While the addict is scheming to find a way to provide for the next hit for themselves. They are coveting all the way along. You see the addict sees the next hit in everything and everyone. Everything that could be sold produces the money for the next hit. And every person that comes along the way is the person who could provide the way to the next hit. And so they begin to covet the things and the people who can get them to the next hit. No matter how we slice it, whether we jump to a drastic Example, like addiction, or we're just talking about simple everyday things that people covet, like their neighbor's car, or their house, or their fancy job. The primary problem with covetousness is simple. It's not just a matter of material things. The primary problem with covetousness is that covetousness is a problem of the heart. When the heart should be panting after God, it is panting rather after meaningless, worthless, and temporary things of this world. In our text for today, Jesus expands upon that 10th commandment by teaching with a parable. Remember, a parable is a word story or a word picture that Jesus is is using as an illustration when he's teaching. He told the story of a rich man whose fields produced an abundant of harvest. 
he, wondering what he should do with all this overflowing grain, this overflowing wealth, he decided to build up many barns in which to store this abundant wealth, this abundant harvest. He was simply thinking, whenever my barns get full, I'll just tear them down and build bigger barns and keep building bigger and bigger barns all the time so that I have more and more place to store all of this abundant harvest. I will never run out of grain. Then, once I have more than enough grain for the rest of my life, I will just sit back, be fat, happy, and sassy. I will eat, drink, and be merry. That, of course, is when Jesus enters the scene of the story. He says, well, our earthly perspective would say, well, at least the rich man was responsible, right? He didn't go out and waste all of that grain, waste all of that wealth. He had a savings account, if you will. He stored it up for himself. He put it where it could be used. And Jesus says, yeah, but by who? Just himself. Jesus asks, what about his neighbor? And more importantly, what about the man across the street whose field didn't produce the harvest? The man across the street who wakes up every single day and he has dealt with covetousness because he says, if only I could have my neighbor's field. Man, if I could only have one of those barns for my family, it would feed us for the rest of our lives. You see, Jesus, as he so often does, he turned the table upside down on the matter of covetousness. He did not say somehow that it was no longer wrong to covet. He did not suggest that somehow the Ten Commandments were now null and void, but what he was suggesting is this. As bad as it is to have a heart that is all consumed by desire, it is equally as bad to have a heart that is all consumed by greed. Covetousness and greed go hand in hand. I think that we often believe that those who covet something are usually not in the position to be greedy. But the problem is this. We've mixed up wants with covet. Remember what covet means. It's an all-consuming desire. Often those who have placed an improper importance on the value of material things, people, relationships, situations, those are often the same people we would classify as greedy. Those tend to be the people who would hoard things, the people who would take people and relationships and situations all for themselves. These are the people who began by coveting, wanting so desperately for themselves. Tony Evans sums up the problem of greed and covetousness this way. He says, Greed appeals to people from all walks of life, regardless of income or social status. No one is immune to the intacts of covetousness. It is when... The material takes priority over the spiritual. Remember, life does not consist of stuff. Don't let possessions take your eyes off Jesus. Don't let possessions take your eyes off Jesus. I want to give you today three ways to guard our hearts and our lives against covetousness and against greed. Three ways to guard our hearts and our lives against covetousness and greed. And the first one is this. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Now you might be thinking to yourself, there's kinds of greed? Isn't greed greed? There's this book called Godonomics. It's written by Chad Hovind, and it presents four types of greed that we should be on guard against. In that book, Chad Hovind writes this. He says, greed is like a termite. 
It's out of sight, but it's boring deep into our hearts. It doesn't attract attention as it eats away at our ability to be generous. Jesus warned us to be on our guard so we can assume we are already infested with greed. See what he says? If Jesus warned us to be on guard against it, it must mean that we're already infected by it. So, what are the four types of greed that we should be watching out for? The first one he mentions is hoarding. That's a type of greed. He says, hoarding is the greed in the life of the hoarder that leads one to believe that they cannot be generous until they have first set aside enough for themselves. That sounds like the guy we read about in Luke 12 today, right? As long as they might possibly have a need, as long as they might possibly have a need, which means that never ever could they possibly have enough because they could always conceive possibly having a need for more, then they can't share with anybody else because there could be a need someday. That's the hoarding greed. So the hoarder keeps on hoarding out of a fear of going without. The, the second type of greed is overspending. Overspending is a greed that is born out of impatience. The overspender confuses needs with wants, and the results is that they spend more than their income allows. And that incurs debt. Credit relieves this need, and it also relieves the need for patience. So it creates all kinds of problems. The third kind of greed is comparison greed. We call this, ready for it? Keeping up with the Joneses. With greed comes spending. With spending comes trouble. There's value in looking like everyone else, having the same thing as everybody else. This type of greed is very loosely or very closely aligned with the sins of envy and jealousy. And the fourth kind of greed is called entitlement. Greed rears its ugly head in every level of society, regardless of income, success, or social status. Entitlement greed suggests that because of one's socioeconomic status or lower social status, one is owed some kind of special opportunity to make it big, to live the life, because there are those who have it all, but that ain't me, so I should be given some special opportunity to have it all. There's a fundamental problem with entitlement. It's perennially short-sighted on something we call work ethic. This greed is grounded in wanting it all, but not wanting to work for it, but rather feeling owed. At the end of the day, Scripture is clear about these types of greed. It's very clear when it talks about it. Colossians 3, verse 5, Paul writes this. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he talks about these things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Okay? And then he calls them something. He says, because these are all idolatry. And they're idolatry because they're something we put above God in priority. The second thing that we can do to guard ourselves against covetousness and greed is that we can remember life is about so much more than an abundance of possessions. Life is about so much more than an abundance of possessions. As he summarized our text for today about the rich farmer who kept building more and more barns, Tony Evans writes this. He says, the moral of this story is that God doesn't bless you just so that you can build bigger spaces. He blesses you so that you can bless others. The man's wealth is not the issue here. It's that he hoarded it for himself with no thought of God or the temporal nature of it. Though he was physically rich, he was spiritually poor. He had everything except God, which ultimately left him with nothing. And I agree with Pastor Evans wholeheartedly. I want to ask you to consider that point this morning in light of another passage of Scripture for a moment. I want you to consider Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is called the Great Love Chapter. 1 Corinthians 
13, one through three says this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but, mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Amen. Now, amen, right, but... If you've ever been to a wedding, you've probably heard this passage, right? In fact, we've all heard this passage probably a thousand times before. But I want you to consider this passage differently this morning. What if we swap out the word love every time for God's name? What if we put God's name where we see the word love? And before we do that, I want to give you the reason why I think we should do that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 reads this way. It says, And so we know and we rely on the love God has for us. And it says right here, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. So if God is love, I think we are justified in swapping out love for God, right? Are you with me? So let's swap it out. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, swapped out. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have God, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all of the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have God, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have God... I gain nothing. Listen, just like that rich farmer, you could have barn after barn after barn full of whatever it is you think has value, whatever it is you think will get you through whatever it is that's coming. But I promise you this, I know what is coming. Well, I don't know exactly what is coming. <laughs> and I don't know exactly when it's coming. But guess what? I do know who exactly is coming. I know who exactly is coming with 100% assurance. And I know exactly why he is coming with 100% assurance. Jesus is coming. He is coming to rescue home his faithful church. And I can tell you this, I know with 100% assurance, he is coming soon. And when he comes, he isn't going to give two rips how many barns you have filled up. His only concern is going to be whether or not there is any room left in your heart for him. So while we walk this earth, we certainly have a need for some material things. But their usefulness is limited to our time here on earth. We should be storing up what really, truly matters. The things of God, heavenly riches, spiritual rewards, making our reservations at God's hotel. The third way we can protect our lives against covetousness and greed. Consider what will become of you when you no longer truly need all that stuff. What will happen to it? Will it be wasted? If so, then how have you been a faithful steward of God's resources? So brothers and sisters, one last and hopefully powerful argument against greed. What will happen to all your stuff when you're no longer here? Um, there was a man that just received news that his cancer was inoperable. He had a very short time to live. His doctor advised him that he didn't know the length or the amount of time of his prognosis. It would not be long, he said. And so the man should start to get his, orders in affair, or his affairs in order, the other way around. So a few days later, this man sat down with his family. He shared the news, and he began to discuss what would happen with his estate. And about an hour or so into the conversation, the man's son stopped the conversation, and he asked, Dad, what were you thinking? 
What in the world did you expect us to do with all of this stuff? Why haven't you allowed us to help you get rid of this stuff sooner? The look on the man's face was one of great rejection. And the entire family could see it. The old man had spent his entire life building that life in that house and on that property. He had hoped that the family heirlooms and the things that he had kept would be passed down and cherished for generations to come. He had hoped that the family would keep the house and the barn and and another generation of that family would grow up on that homestead. Listen, folks, it is not uncommon for this situation to occur. What one generation values, the next generation overlooks. What one generation has spent a lifetime preserving, another generation lets go of so easily. And at some point, we are left asking this question, was it worth it? I am not here today to tell you to sell all of your family heirlooms because your grandchildren and your children don't want them. But I'm here to offer you this illustration. What has value to one generation often has very little value to the next. It can be so hard to determine what to hold on to when it comes to the things that are near and dear to our hearts, items that have sentimental value, family heirlooms. They all seem so priceless to us, but at the end of the day, They're things. When it comes to your life, as hard as it is to think about sometimes, particularly when it comes to the end of your life, what will come of all of your stuff? What will be your legacy when you no longer need it? And more importantly, what testimony to the grace of God in Christ Jesus will be left behind when you are no longer here. Because you see, when we parse it down, Jesus' parable today, even when we boil down the 10th commandment, I think we end up in the same place at the end of the day when people look at your life What will they say about you? And what will they say about your faithfulness as a steward of God's resources? Will they say that you were faithful with the little in as much as you were faithful with the much? Or will they notice that perhaps you did have an affinity for things, a love for the material, and a passion for, well, stuff? Jesus warned that rich farmer. He said, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Brothers and sisters, what a blessed opportunity we have been given to share what we have today. This very day. Let's set our eyes on need, not greed. And let's endeavor to be faithful stewards of everything we've been given, right? Listen, brothers and sisters, it is not easy being a Christ follower, is it? But it is so very worth it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we do thank you for these many difficult words you have given to us about life as a Christian, as a Christ follower. It is not easy, Father. And so we recognize that more than anything, what we need is your help along the way. We need the guidance the movement, the illumination, and the power of your Holy Spirit every single day if we have any hope of being a Christ follower. Father, we do endeavor to be focused on need, not greed. We do endeavor to share, to be faithful stewards of all that you've given to us. We do not want to be guilty 
of the greed of hoarding or the greed of comparison or the greed of entitlement. Father, fix our eyes on you. Help us to be content in all that you have given to us. And Lord, when trials come our way, when moments come where we wonder if there will be enough, when we wonder how we will make it through, let us lean, Father, then on the moments when you have given us abundantly and be reminded that there has never been a moment that you have not seen us through. Contentment in you, Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider. But Father, we need our help. We need your help in this. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand and sing with us?
brothers and sisters, there is a breaking in your direction. There's a shifting in your favor, and it happens when the blessing of God the Father comes on you. It doesn't happen when you scheme to make things happen. It doesn't happen when you lose patience with him and you find ways to make things happen. There's a breaking in your favor. There's a shifting in your direction when God works for you, when you wait patiently for him. But that's not easy. That takes patience. It takes endurance. And most importantly, it takes some Holy Spirit governing your life. So let me send you out now to be people of need, not greed, with the power of God the Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Have a wonderful week. Don't forget to stop by, pick up all that extra stuff.